virtues that Jesus brings to us. Hope, love, joy, and peace. As a whole, these candles represent the coming of the light of Christ into the world. The Advent wreath reminds us of whom we are called to be as followers of Jesus. The evergreen wreath represents eternity. During the season of Advent, one candle on the wreath is lit each Sunday. Each candle represents an aspect of the spiritual preparation for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the first Sunday of Advent today, the first candle is lit. This candle is typically called the prophecy candle. In remembrance of the prophets, primarily Isaiah, who foretold the birth of Christ. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah 7. The first candle represents hope or expectation in anticipation of the coming of Christ and now of his second coming. Let's continue to worship the Lord together. What child is this?
Aren't you guys glad today that God is with us? And we have the hope that Christ, as Kathy was saying, will return and that we will be with him. During this time of the year, you know, um, as a nation, Christmas was not really popular in the United States until 1870. Did you guys know that? How many of you guys remember 1870? Um, that's what I'm saying. So Christmas was not really a popular thing in the United States until 1870. And actually, in the United States, Christmas, if you celebrated, celebrated Christmas in the early time, you were buying five shillings. That goes back to the 1600s, which was quite a little bit of money. So here we have this time of the year, it's celebrated with hope. Um, and originally, Christmas was a celebration of hope because the worst part of winter was over. And you had the hope of the new uh, year coming. You had the hope of longer days, more daylight hours. And so the end of December was that time period that was perfect for it. The meat uh, had been, all the cows had been slaughtered, so the uh, meat was plentiful. But, you know, it's like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, 1939 is actually when Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer became popular. And it was because of Montgomery Ward's an advertisement campaign to bring hope and to get people to go out and buy things so that they had hope of a better year. Did you guys know that? So Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer came about because of Montgomery Ward's. But we celebrate today as Americans. We celebrate because we have reason to give hope because Christ has given us that. How many of you guys would agree with that today? So we can come and we can do that. We celebrate the birth of a Savior and the King called Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, we see that God is giving us hope. As it was already read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel. The nation of Israel had been long looking for that promise for 700 years. And during that 700 years, we came into what we call the 400 years of silent years. The prophets, they just weren't there. And so today, we're going to be looking in the book of Luke. And I know that Christmas, we put everything into a 30-minute or an hour uh, program. And we have the shepherds, we have the wise men, we have Mary and Joseph. And we have all those things that are going on. And we put it into an hour's time period. But did you know that Christmas actually lasted almost four years? You say, Dave, how can that be? Because by the time the wise men reached Christ, it was almost three years later. And so we put all these things into what's going on. And Mary, she had had the hope of the Savior coming. She had had the hope of all those things that were promised. But have we ever looked at Christmas through the eyes of Mary? In Luke chapter 1, and in the first part of Luke, we, we come across a man that he was a priest. And he had gone to the temple to do his priestly duties as it was the lot had fallen upon him. <coughs> and his name was Zachariah, and his wife's name was Elizabeth. And Zechariah was in the temple. And all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Hey, I want you to know that your wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a baby. He laughed. He laughed at the angel. He says, You don't seem to understand. My wife is, let's put it plainly, is an old lady. She's past the childbearing age. That's not going to happen. And what happened? The angel of the Lord said, because of your unbelief, you're going to be dumb. He says, you won't be able to talk until the, that time comes forward. And your wife will get uh, a son. And your name's named John. And he's going to be the forerunner for the Christ that's coming. Man, here all of a sudden, all these things are going on. And then we pick up the story with Mary. So we go to Luke chapter 1 and beginning in verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel 
was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and trying to discern what sort of greeting this might mean. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you today with hope. <coughs> Lord, with what you've given us. Lord, I ask that you help me to share the word of God, Lord, in the fashion you've given it to me. And Father, we ask, Lord, that we would just continue to look for hope. <coughs> in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Mary had grown up with an understanding that Christ was going to be born. She had understood that there was going to be a baby that was going to be born, and his name was going to be called Emmanuel, and he was going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And here you have Luke, a physician, a doctor, and Luke, in two times in that verse, mentions that a virgin would conceive and give a child to the world that would save the world. And we take a look at that, and I think Luke is writing it from the, the standpoint of the doctor saying, wait a minute, this is really happening, this really did happen. I'm a doctor, and I want you to know that this was because of God. But you have Mary. Mary was troubled. She'd never really thought about, well, am I the one to be the mother of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world? She was probably about 14 to 15 during that time period. And here she is, and the angel of the Lord stands before Mary and begins to speak to her. And he says, Mary says, I want you to know that you are highly favored. You have a special gift that God is going to give you. How many of you would be startled if you had an angel stand before you and all of a sudden began to speak to you? I would be blown away. And I think that my reactions probably would have not been the same as Mary. But here she was. Here is an angel standing, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But it says she was greatly troubled at the saying. And she was trying to process all this information. Wait a minute. For 700 years, we've been told that the Savior of the world is going to be born. For 400 years, we haven't heard from any of the prophets. And here is an angel standing before Mary. And Mary said, I, Man, I just can't wrap my mind around that. And she was troubled. And we read on. And it says, And the angel of the Lord said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and in the first greetings that she has with Gabriel, <coughs> she was troubled. And then again the angel says, you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. How many of you would like to receive a greeting like that from God? And here she had already heard rumors that her cousin Elizabeth was with a child. See, they didn't have email, they didn't have, you know, all the media that we do today. And in verse 31 it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he'll be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High, the Lord God, 
will give him the throne of David, his father David. And he will reign over the house forever. In his kingdom there will be no end. And here Mary is trying to process everything. She's found in favor. So let's take a look at Mary's character as to what type of person Mary was. Mary was a righteous woman. Mary was one that feared God. Mary was one that thought, how can this be? How can it happen to me? I'm only 14 to 15 years of age. How in the world can this happen to me? And here you have the angel standing forward and said, do not be afraid, you're going to have a baby. And he's going to be the son of God. He's going to be the king of kings. He's going to be the Lord of lords. And Mary said to the angel, How can it be since I am a virgin? Uncertainty. Everything else comes into Mary's mind at that moment. What's the community going to think? Man, I know the, the law in the book of Leviticus. It says that if a woman is found out of the man, that she should be stoned. Do you think Mary was thinking those things? What, what, about, what about Joseph? How am I going to explain this to Joseph? How am I going to explain this to what's going on? And she was concerned with uncertainty. Perhaps those thoughts were running through her mind. How am I going to explain it to my mom and dad? And then the angel of the Lord again comforted her. And he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Holy Son of God. Wow. The Holy Son of God. And I'm sure that by then, Mary, at the age of 14 to 15, all of a sudden her mind starts processing what the angel had just said. And she said, I'm going to be the mother of the Savior of the world. That hope that I've been hoping for, that I've heard about, my entire life that has been preached in the nation of Israel for 700 years, and God has found favor on me. And what's the next thing the angel Gabriel says to her? He says, and behold, he says, your cousin Elizabeth, depending on the translation, it might say your relative Elizabeth, who is well advanced in years and past that point of childbearing, she's going to have a baby. As a matter of fact, she is in her sixth month of pregnancy. Wow. And Mary starts processing all the information that's going on. And Mary, we find out Because the angel said, for nothing with God shall be impossible. And in all of our musicals, we hear the angels, you know, the choir comes up and sings, and for with God, nothing shall be impossible. You know, and we have that whole entourage of things that's going on as it builds. And it's just Gabriel speaking to her, and he says, and with God, nothing is impossible. And Mary's still pondering all these thoughts that are going on in her mind. And then she says, As the Lord will, I am God's humble servant. I was talking to the fellows the other day, and I said, What would have happened if Mary had said, Man, go pick somebody else? 
I'm not the woman for that job. I don't want that. Would God have honored her request? Is God a gentleman? Does God force us to do things that we don't want to do? But I believe that God knew, because God knows everything, that Mary would come to him with a humble heart and say, let me be God's servant and let it be as you commanded. Maybe the humiliation during that time period, Mary said, you know, with God who just told me nothing will be impossible. God, I know that you're going to protect me. God, you're going to take care of me. And see, a lot of times we put our Christmas into a 30-minute program or an hour program. And I wonder about the thoughts that Mary had as she was going through and doing that. Lord, I'm your humble servant. Mary was now able to anticipate the birth of the Savior of the world. Not only that, Mary looked at it and said, wow, because of what God is doing in my life, <coughs> my baby will save all eternity. It says, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to the town of Judea, and entered to the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped inside of her. And it says, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed, because you are among women, and blessed is the fruit. You notice that Elizabeth did not see you are blessed above women. Elizabeth said you are blessed among the women. In other words, Mary, yes, is the mother of Christ. What a great honor that was. But Elizabeth says, I want you to know that you are blessed among women. You're still walking amongst us. You're not above us, but you are highly favored. There's a special situation that's going on in your life. And it goes on and it says, and this is uh, granted to me, the mother of the Lord, to come. For behold, when the sound of the greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what is spoken from the Lord. And then in verse 46, and it says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior. And see, in all of our Christmas musicals and everything else, we have a Mary. She comes out, she breaks into song during this time period. Am I right? Isn't that how our Christmas stories go? And we go in and we have the anticipation, we have the hope. And here, Mary's soul is filled with joy. Everything about Mary now during this three month period of time, I honestly believe that God was preparing her for everything that she was going to face during that time period. <clears throat> to be the mother of the Savior of the world. And during that three month period of time, if you go back and you read it, I don't know when or how soon the angel appeared to Joseph after she became pregnant. It could have happened right away. It could have happened a month later. It could have happened a couple weeks later. We don't know. But God was preparing Mary during those three months. She was being ministered to by a relative. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth, that were God-fearing people. And as she's going through and doing this, everything that I read about Mary was coming into that point in her life that she glorified God. And in verse 48, for as he looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on all generations will be called, be blessed. For if he who is mighty has done great things for me and his holy name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation, he has shown his strength with his arms, he has scattered the proud to their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estates. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty-handed. He has helped to serve to Israel in remembrance of the mercy. He has spoken to the fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring. And in verse 56, and it says, And Mary remained with her three months. And then went home. Imagine a 14-year-old girl today. Today, our society probably wouldn't have the same opinion as what they did of Mary. If a 14-year-old girl today became pregnant and not Mary, it's not as a bad as a taboo as it was then. Am I right? Today we look at it and say, well, things happen. But Mary was going through all these things, and for three months, she was being ministered to by her cousin Elizabeth, who also had a baby of her that was also a special child. She was learning to trust God in everything that she did. Mark Lowry, some years ago, wrote a song, Mary, Did You Know? Mary, Did You Know? And Michael English sings it better than anybody else. At least that's what my wife told me. And I believe my wife. So we're going to listen to Mary, Did You Know? from Michael English. <laughs> Thank you. 
things Mary knew that her baby would do. She knew that her baby was going to be the savior of the world. She knew that her baby was going to be king of kings and lord of lords. She knew that her baby was the son of God and walked for angels and tried. I don't think that Mary knew that that one day her baby boy would die on a cross. I don't think that Mary knew that one day that her son, Jesus, would walk on water. I don't think that Mary knew a lot of things, but Mary knew that she was about to become the mother of Jesus, the Savior of the world, the hope for all of us. As we come in and as we continue with this Christmas season, we do have a hope that Jesus has come into our world. But we can't look at the, the baby in the manger without looking really what's behind that tree. Because that tree was going to become the cross that was nailed to the cross. Yeah, this is just one of those put together fake trees. But the evergreen tree, God is eternal. And Mary knew that. Mary did realize a lot of things. But there was a lot that Mary did not know. But Mary was comforted by the Holy Spirit. If you would stand with me. Next week we're going to be looking at Christmas through the eyes of Joseph. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us hope. Lord, Christmas is full of hope. Our nation, during some of the darkest times, wanted a reason to give people hope. But God, this Christmas season, help us to remember what you've really done for us. Lord, I know that during this time, a lot of people are depressed. Lord, they've lost loved ones. First Christmas without their loved ones. But Father, I ask that as your people, Lord, that we would be able to go into our community and Lord, live a life in our community that would give people hope that you are the answer. Lord, that regardless of what they're going through, there is hope. Father, I thank you, Lord, for who you are. And God, I thank you for the things that you're doing. In the name of Jesus, amen.